Uh, I want to uh, welcome you all to the third lecture in our series, Learning at Loxahatchee. And the whole idea of this is to make you smarter and more aware of the surroundings you're in. And today we're going to talk about the iconic critter of the state, the Florida Gator. There'll be no lecture for the next two weeks because of the holidays, but on the 7th of January, we will have a lecture on fish. And that's Alligator also food. interesting on native <laughs> fish, invasive fish, what to do in your community if you want to get rid of the fish or bring in more fish, everything you want to know about fish, including what's safe to eat. And we will have fish tanks. So, and someone's going to have to take them home after, you know, we're finished with them. So. Who will be the speaker, Lou? Uh, Kelly Gestring from the Florida Wildlife Conservation So, but today let's focus on, on alligators. And Dr. Laura Brandt is here to give you this lecture. And she's brought some critters, a critter with her. Laura has been teaching, and learning, and talking about alligators almost her entire professional career. I could take a lot of time to describe what she's done, but that would impact the time available for her. Suffice it to say, she has a Bachelor of Science, a Master of Science, and a PhD from leading university. She used to be the lead biologist at this refuge and then was promoted to the regional scientist working out of Fort Lauderdale for the Fish and Wildlife uh, Agency. And her job is to make sure that the policy makers and the decision makers at government level listen to the science that's available. In other words, to make a considered judgment on policy based upon science. Um, so let me turn the lecture over to Laura now, and sit back, please silence your cell phones, and we're going to turn down the lights, and here is Dr. Laura Frank. Thanks, Lou. I, I always like coming here, and I always like giving these kinds of talks, because I have a captive audience here. Um, Lou, would you, when you get back there, you please close and lock the door? Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how many gators do we have here? 150,000. No. Go Gators. <laughs> All right. So, actually, my PhD is from from University of Florida, so I am a gator in many respects. But as Lou said, I've been studying alligators uh, a lot a lot longer than that. Um, and today, I'm going to talk to you about the crocodilians that we have in South Florida why we want to study them, a little bit about alligator basics, some of the monitoring that we do for Ever Everglades restoration using alligators, and then you'll get to be up close and personal with an alligator. And I had originally wanted to bring um, both an alligator and a caiman, and we'll talk about caimans in a minute. The, 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 uh, there's good news and there's bad news. Um, the bad news is I wasn't able to get a caiman, the good news is I wasn't able to get a caiman because the guys that went out and, and tried to catch one for me couldn't get one because they'd done such a good job of getting rid of them in the area that they, they were working in. So unfortunately, all I have is an alligator for you guys to, to see and, and to, to look at. <clears throat> so we have actually two native crocodilians in Florida, the American alligator and the American crocodile. And the American alligator, people always ask me what's the difference between Amer alligators and crocodiles. Well, one of the most uh, obvious differences is in their coloration and the shape of their snout. Alligators are almost black in color, and they have a shovel-shaped snout. Crocodiles are more olive gray, olive green in color, and have a much pointier snout. Another difference is when you look and you get up close to them and you, you look for their teeth, you can't see the teeth when an alligator has its mouth closed because they fit into um, 
the jaw there in, 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 in a way that they're, they're hidden. Whereas we see with a crocodile, you can actually see the teeth there, and they have a little groove on, the, on their um, upper jaw where the, teeth, the fourth tooth on the bottom fits into it. And so you can actually see them exposed. And hence, one of the terms crocodile smile, because you have the, the teeth there <coughs> that, you, that you can see. Um, we have, as I mentioned, a third species of crocodilian in Florida that is not native to Florida. It's not native to the United States. It's from, from Central and South America. And that's the spectacled caiman. And they are very close relatives to alligators, actually cousins to them. And so they look more similar to alligators than they do to crocodiles with a more rounded snout and um, closer in color to alligators than, than to crocodiles. And one of the reasons they're called spectacled is because they actually have a little bony ridge here right under their eyes that makes it look like they have little spectacles on. And as I mentioned, there's a population down in, in Homestead, Florida City area that we've been working on trying to get rid of uh, from the area. They're not native. They're a little bit more aggressive than alligators. Um, and so they do um, pose a threat to, to native wildlife and native wildlife communities. The range of the American alligator occurs all the way historically from Virginia to South Florida and then all the way west into Texas. We are at the southern portion of the alligator's range here. We are at the northern portion of the American crocodile's range. And crocodiles, American crocodiles occur in Central and South America, and their northern, historic northern distribution was in the coastal areas in South Florida. We're the only place in the world where we have both alligators and crocodiles. So the see you later alligator after wild crocodile is biologically correct when you, when you use it here. So people always wonder, well, why do you want to study these things? You know, they're, they're, I mean, for me, they're very fascinating. You know, they're, they're, they're very old uh, type of species. Um, they're perceived as being fierce and, and you know, man eaters and all of that. Um, but there's a lot of other reasons that we, we want to study them. We, we, some of them are rare, like the American crocodile was listed as endangered. It's now listed as threatened because populations have increased. Um, we also want to know about them because we like to exploit them. How many people have something alligator? Wallet, shoes, watch band? Okay. Um, how many people have eaten alligator meat? Okay, so, so they have an they have a exploitation value there. And then another reason is that we have interactions between crocodilians and humans. And this is one of the big challenges with the American crocodile right now because their populations have increased, but what we've done is we've developed the coastal areas, and so where they used to occur, there are now people. So when the crocodiles are trying to, to find places to nest and to live, they're coming in contact with people like at the University of Miami, in Biscayne Bay, on Ocean Reef, down in Key Largo. And so, you know, what do you do about those things? So the more we know about the crocodilians, the better we can help to uh, keep people out of where crocodiles, crocodilians are, are likely to be. We also study them because they make very good ecological indicators. They're very much tied to water, and water is the lifeblood of the Everglades, both the freshwater and the estuarine areas, um, related to things like system productivity. We'll talk a little bit about that, the fish that if you come to the lecture in, in a couple weeks, you'll hear, hear about, um, the types of habitats that are out there. And then it can, they can tell us something about the types of potential contaminants that there are in, in the ecosystem. So there's a lot of good reasons to study them, aside from the fact that it's fun. They can tell us a lot about what's going on with Everglades restoration. And alligators and crocodiles um, are what, together, are what we call the crocodilian indicator for restoration. And this is because crocodiles 
can tell us something about the um, freshwater flows to Florida Bay, to the estuaries and the health of that system, and alligators can tell us something about the freshwater marshes. Uh, and historically, you know, they were the, the, like the buffalo on the plains. They have a lot of ecological functions there in creating different landscape patterns and uh, serving both as uh, predators, eating things that are smaller than them, and then as prey, because when they're small, other things eat them. So they, they have a very key role in Everglades, in, in, wetland in wetland ecosystem, and in particular in the Everglades. So just some kind of natural history about alligators and crocodiles, because it's one of the other things people say, well, what's, you know, going from that, you look at the appearance, what's the difference between alligators and crocodiles other than that? Um, the, one of the biggest things that, that you know, people are interested in is, is the whole mating and nesting and, and, and all of that. And they do have slightly different timing in when they mate. Alligators are a little bit, are in May and June, and crocodiles are a little bit earlier in March and April. And you'll hear, you'll start, you'll actually start hearing some of the male, uh, some of the alligators starting to bellow in the spring, and a lot of that depends on the water, uh, water air and water temperature and, and, and rainfall. Um, they nest, um, at, at, again, crocodiles nest slightly earlier in April and May and then alligators in June and July. So if you're walking around here, walking around the marsh trail and things like that, we've had alligator nests out there. This is the time of year when the mom alligator will be out building that nest, and so that's when you really have to start watching to see if they're out there. The eggs incubate through um, the summer. For alligators, the incubation period is about 63 days. For crocodiles, it's about 90 days. And then the babies hatch out. Um, and interestingly enough, with alligators, the mama, and I'll show you some pictures of this. Mama will, will uh, sometimes stay with the young and, and defend them, whereas in crocodiles, that's very rare that, that you have the mama crocodile associated with the babies after, after they hatch. Clutch sizes are a little bit different. Crocodiles, it's a little bit it, bigger. And again, there's a range here, but on average, there's about 40 uh, eggs in a crocodile nest and about 30 in an alligator nest. And they, they um, grow for alligators about 6 to 12 inches a year, and for crocodiles a little bit faster, about 10 to 12 inches a year. And again, this is depending on where the animal is and how much uh, it's stressed and how much resources it has to be able to put into growth. Crocodiles are a little bit larger than alligators when at their, at their maximum size, and in both species, males are bigger than females. And so if you see a nine-foot alligator, m more than likely it's a male, not, not a female. Both of these species occur in the estuary areas where there's that mixture between salt and freshwater. They also both prefer freshwater. People ask me, well, you know, what about the saltwater crocodiles that we have in Florida? Well, we don't have saltwater crocodiles. We have American crocodiles that occur in coastal areas and do use the saltwater areas, but they're not like the saltwater crocodiles in Australia. Um, the crocodiles will tolerate saltwater, and they nest in the, in the saltier areas, but the babies actually require some fresh water when they're, when they're little or they won't be able to survive. And this is one of the things that makes them good as using as an indicator for Everglades restoration because historically they would nest in places where they would have access to fresh water right after the hatchlings um, hatched, um, either through rainfall <coughs> or through water coming through the creeks. And so we can look at their growth and survival now and tell whether or not we're, we're kind of uh, mimicking those patterns that um, are, are, are best for crocodiles. So they eat, uh, and basically they eat a lot of the same kinds of things. And they'll eat everything that moves and some things that don't. And so depending on where they are, whether it's freshwater or, or uh, more brackish water that, you know, they'll eat different species of, of fish. Um, the bigger they are, the bigger the things that they eat. And this can include things like turtles. That is a soft-shelled turtle that that one, that guy's got. Fish. Deer, it's National Geographic. Um, <laughs> and in some cases, other alligators. So, and that happens when, when, you get, when you get really dry periods and they concentrate together. 
and they're all looking for food and so if you're smaller it, it happens sometimes too during the mating season um, when when the, the after a um, you know, kind of a territorial incident if this you know for example that animal may have thought he could take this guy on and didn't quite make it so the other thing that people are really interested in is is nesting and this is one of the places where people may actually interact with alligators whether it's intentional or unintentional because if you happen to be around an alligator nest and there's a mama that's very defensive she might be upset about that and it might be one of those cases where it, it poses a, a threat to you alligators build nests out of vegetation they can they one of the things that's really cool is they can build it right in the marsh there so what she did was she took the sawgrass and just piled it up made her own dry ground to do that and this is good for her but it's also good for other things that live in the marsh a lot of plants can then grow on this area afterwards and uh, I don't know if this started this is actually an alligator nest here um, amongst the 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 tree um, tree limbs here tree trunks I don't know whether that started as an alligator nest and then the tree grew in it or whether she took advantage of a little high ground patch or a combination of the two so there's a wide variety of places that that they'll nest they'll also nest on tree islands up underneath the canopy there the mama alligator a lot of times will defend her nest and so you'll find her with the nest there and she's not really happy that you're there um, this can be good and it can be bad when you're trying to figure out what's going on in the nest and she's there defending it it actually is good because you can catch her and then you know where she is what's more scary is when you don't find her and you're opening up the nest because you have no idea whether she's sitting over there waiting for you to get in an uncomfortable position to before she kind of comes out and, and does her defensive work this is good for her for eggs um, it's also good for other things like turtles that might want to nest have a place that's protected um, to, to lay their eggs and so we find a lot of turtle eggs in alligator nests we find snake eggs we find lizard eggs uh, so it's it, you know they provide this other habitat not only for for alligators but for other wildlife within uh, marsh systems and this is what the eggs look like they're you know a little bit bigger than than goose eggs they're a hard egg they're, just, they're like when you when you hard boil an egg and you've got the hard shell and then you've got that that kind of membrane on there that's that's what these are like um, they she'll lay like I said she'll lay about 30 eggs in there and in in layers and the height of how big how high up she bakes that mound is dependent upon the water at the time the water level at the time that she nests and this is one of the things that make them really tied to to hydrology and natural water patterns is that if it's dry in the spring when she nests her nest her her clutch will be lower and so it in in what had happened historically was if it's lower in the spring it's going to be lower in the fall even if there's a lot of rain because there's that correlation between the, the rainfall patterns what we've done in some areas with water management is we've disrupted that and so low spring water levels don't necessarily relate to what the water level in the fall is going to be and you see this along the canals a lot and so if you have a, ch a change of about a foot and a half of water level then you could flood out the um, the nest which will which will kill the eggs resulting in fewer of these little guys coming out in August and September and these guys are really cute I mean I think baby alligators are really cute and they they will uh, their mama comes back and helps them out of the nest she might um, she she it's interesting because you know there's discussions about well, how does she know when to come back and in some cases the uh, baby alligators even when they're in the nest will do their little baby grunt And I've actually heard it on a nest. So when I was working in South Carolina, I would wait till the nest would hatch. And so sometimes I'd walk up to the nest and I could actually hear the babies chirping in the nest before I even got there. And so that's how, one of the ways that she knows how to, to, when it's time for her to open the nest. Unfortunately, raccoons can also hear that. And so in, in areas with high raccoon densities, that might be 
detrimental. But she'll go and they have a little egg tooth, and I don't think you can really see it on there, on the tip of their snout, and they'll kind of poke at the top of the egg and then get themselves out. In other cases, and this is one of my favorite things about alligators is because, you know, they can crush a turtle's shell with, it, with their strength of their jaw. But the mama alligator will come, she'll come into this nest, she'll pick this egg up in her mouth, roll it around gently and crack it so that the baby alligator can come out. Then she'll gently carry that baby alligator down to the water and put it in the water so that it can swim away and with no marks on it. So it's, it's, just, it's just kind of amazing to me that something that's so powerful like that, that also can be that, that gentle and can have that, that kind of touch to be able to know how much to, to, to bite on that egg to get it to, to open up. So another thing people ask is how many alligators are there? Well, we don't, in the, in the refuge, we don't have an absolute number. Um, what we can do is we can go out and we can do surveys and we can get um, an index of what, what, how many alligators are out there, and we call it relative density. And we do this every um, spring and every fall. We do it at night, in what we call night, nighttime eye shine counts. We use a big flashlight, we go out in an airboat, and we shine across the area looking for their eye shine which look like bicycle reflectors, which many of you can do if you have a canal in your backyard. You can take a big flashlight out and, and shine out there to see if you have any alligators in there. You gotta look straight down the beam of the canal. I mean, straight down the beam of the flashlight because it, it reflects the light back. Um, like I said, just like a bicycle reflector. And then we can go up to the animal and get a size estimate. Uh, and so we have an idea of uh, how many we see along our set survey routes and then what size they are. And we can look at this in a variety of different areas. I do the surveys here in the refuge. We have a bunch of other people cooperatively from University of Florida, USGS, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission that do them in other places. And we can then compare among the different areas how many alligators we have relative to each other. So we use what we, alligators per kilometer as our measure. And you can see there's a wide range of values Lake Woodruff and Lake Apopka are in north central Florida, and you see they have a lot more alligators than most of the Everglades. Loxahatchee here is between those two and is the highest density of alligators south of Lake Okeechobee in, in the, the greater Everglades system. This is, if, if I were an alligator, this is where I would want to be. Um, and then the other areas have lower densities than that. And this red line is how many alligators per kilometer is, is below that number is a warning sign that things are not where we need to be. Um, that's, red is bad. So we'll, I'll show you some, some slides that have red, yellow, and green on them. And it's just like stoplight colors. Um, green is, is good, green is where we want to be. Yellow is mm, not so good, but could be worse. And red is, we don't want to be there. So you see most of our areas in the Everglades, we have lower densities of alligators than um, we think we should have, and we've looked at this over time in these different areas, and here we are up at the top. Um, we've looked at it at all the water conservation areas in Everglades National Park, and the blue lines, blue solid lines, are areas where we're not seeing a declining trend, but the red dashed lines are where we are seeing declining trends. So you can see that there's, you know, there's definitely some, some challenges here. Uh, and this is part of the reason that we're doing Everglades restoration is to help to reverse, stop and, rever and reverse these trends of, of our indicators um, of which alligators are one of them. We've, when we look at this information, we are trying to also relate it to the water patterns so that we can make recommendations for water management and restoration that will help us restore the ecosystem. And so basically, well, a couple of the things that we found is that uh, hydro periods longer than lo 11 months of the year um, are, um, are better for alligators. So that means that there's water on the marsh for at least 11 months. Um, Natural dry downs are good. So the, the Everglades is a naturally fluctuating um, wetland with higher water levels in the fall and lower water levels in the spring. That's a good thing. But if we have it too dry for too long, 
that's bad for everything. It's bad for alligators, it's bad for fish. And so we're starting to hone in on, well, how, how long is bad? How long can it be dry and it, and it not have an effect? Um, and then if we have dry outs too frequently, if it happens too often, it happens every year, that's not a good thing either. So, you know, here, here's an alligator and an example of when it's, it's dried out and a lot of the marsh is dry, there's still these little alligator holes, but it makes it, it, makes it tough. Um, one of the things is fish need water. So if there's, there's no water, then it decreases the fish population, which means then in the following cycle, there's not as much for, for alligators and other things to eat. So we're trying to hone in on these kind of factors to get a better idea of how we can make recommendations for water management on um, these kind of, of measures. We have another measure that we use, and this kind of looks at how, how healthy alligators are in, in the Everglades, and this is body condition. And so this is how fat an animal is relative to its, its length. So it's basically, you think about it as your body mass index. So you go to the doctor and they put you on the scale and they take your height and they say, you're, you know, here's your body mass index or here's the percentile you're in and, and all that. So we catch animals, all these dots are animals we've caught. We caught, catch animals in all these different areas, just like we do the surveys. And we look at their body condition over time. And we do this again in the spring and the fall. And this is one of the most fun parts of studying alligators. We, we catch them, we, we bring them into the boat, and uh, secure them, and measure them, and weigh them. And then we can tell whether they're in good condition. Like this guy, you see how he's got these nice jowls here, and his neck is, you don't see bones in his neck. Or, if they're in not so good condition. And so you see the difference between these two guys. And so we've been able to numerically describe this. So when, when we do that body condition index, we can, we can know, you know whether they're at that end or this end of the, of the spectrum. And this gives us an idea of um, how well we are creating the ecosystem functions that we need to promote healthy alligators and healthy other things within the Everglades. And so we've done the same kind of thing for the body condition that we did with the relative density in that we've looked at it in multiple different areas and this is the areas all in the Everglades and here's Loxahatchee and Loxahatchee is kind of intermediate in terms of body condition. Um, I have some ideas on that. Um, and we've also seen some declines in body condition in some specific areas. Those are the red, the red arrows. And when we look at body condition across the entire Everglades and all of our sampling locations, we've seen a decline since the early 2000s. So, and you also see that all of these body conditions are in the yellow region. And so we're, we're seeing that, you know, we still well, we haven't done a lot of things with that central part of the Everglades that, for the Everglades restoration. And it's just a reminder that we really need to do something um, so that we can return alligators to, you know, the higher values that we were seeing in that early 2000s. And unfortunately, we don't have data prior to that, so we don't know, you know, how this fits in any longer term cycle. Because you can see that there's fluctuations. Um, and there are, that's a natural that's a natural pattern, but it hasn't returned to those higher values. So we, you know, we ask ourselves, and we've been looking at, at how this relates to water levels, and one of the things that it seems to really relate to is how much the water fluctuates in any, any given year. But the other thing that, that we're working on now with some of the fish folks, and Joel Trexler in particular from, from uh, Florida International University, is the amount of food available. I mean, duh. You know, if you don't have anything to eat, you're not going to get fat. And so he's looked at, these are his graphics over here, where he's looked at fish biomass at sites that are close to but not identical to our um, alligator sites. And so, you know, he's seeing similar patterns in some areas of these declines in fish biomass. And so, you know, we're, we're working more on how these things are integrated and then what is that telling us about the, the whole system responses and then um, you know, how can we again use this to help us do better management? <laughs> so we can also put these measures together um, along with some other ones that we use for, for crocodiles to get an idea of, of how crocodilians are doing 
throughout the Everglades over time. And as I said, this again, this is a red, yellow, green um, scale. I don't see any green on there though. Um, <laughs> so the good news is we're not seeing more red. Um, but we're also not seeing a lot of improvements uh, yet. But, but as we start implementing more projects that affect these areas here, we should start to see these values change from um, red to yellow and then hopefully yellow to green. And so that's, that's kind of our, our goal um, in doing some of this monitoring is to help inform that information so that we can help protect the Everglades so that we can continue to be the only place in the world where you can say see you later alligator after a while crocodile and be biologically correct. <laughs> so that's my slide presentation and I can take questions now and then I have an alligator that I brought that we can talk about some of the adaptations that alligators have uh, for living in wetland systems. Yes, sir. Um, the, it, it, it seemed from your presentation that the mother does not sit on the eggs uh, like birds do. No, that's correct. That's correct. So she builds the vegetation mound and to some extent as the vegetation decomposes it creates different temperatures in there. She will come back to the nest and either urinate on it or bring water in her mouth on it Presumably, we don't, we don't completely understand whether she's looking at moisture or whether she's looking at temperature when she's doing that. But she can provide some additional um, control of or influence on the, the, the egg cavity based on those things. So it's primarily just a time, uh, an amount of time until the eggs start to yeah. grow. Yeah, and in fact, it, you know, the, the average is 63 days, but in warmer, wetter years, it'll be shorter. Uh, what is the uh, surface temperature different? Uh, what is the difference in surface temperature on the uh, top of a nest that would de determine uh, male from female uh, from an egg? So, so um, you can get you can get mixed, you can get males and females in the same nest based on that difference, and it's about so it'd be I think about six degrees Fahrenheit, so it's about three degrees okay. Celsius. So, yeah. I'm sure about the yeah. Given all of the numbers that you put together over the years, what is your actual estimate of crocodilians within Florida <laughs> based on the correlation of data? Yeah, we, uh, we, don't, we don't have, for, for all of Florida, we don't have a, an estimate. When you look at the Fish and Wildlife Commission website, you know, I think it's like two million or something alligators, but there's, there's really no way to get that firm an estimate. Um, that's why we go with the relative relative densities um, that, that ha are, are basically an index of that. Then based on relative density, what is your guesstimate? Hmm. Of number of alligators? <laughs> well, we're only doing it here. And if you were, so on those transects that we have, we actually did some population estimates along those transects, and I think we had like 2,000 alligators along that 20-kilometer um, estimate within the refuge here, but it varies from place to place, and so you have to factor that in if you're trying to get a total population estimate. So, back here and then up here. Yes, now, what, um, in the Everglades, uh, are you people worried about the, the Burmese python and its effect on the baby alligators, because that's in their food chain? Um, not really. Um, they're, uh, they, they, they certainly could eat them, um, but, but alligators can also eat baby pythons. So it's, and it's not probably a primary food source, though interestingly when everything else gets devoured, it will be interesting to see if potentially pythons shift to other things in their diet than, than what they're eating now. Uh, in, in that slide where you showed the uh, alligator that did not look so healthy in mm -hmm. that area, are all the alligators in that area not healthy or is there something like survival of the fittest? Or Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question and one of the other things that we like to look at is what percentage of the animals right. are in that skinny condition. 
So, I mean, it's just like in the population of people. You're going to have people at this end, and you're going to have people at this end. So if we see one animal like that out of, so we catch 15 each time we go out. So if we see, you know, one animal like that when we catch our 15, we're not really worried, but there have been times when we've seen like 75% of the animals in that. And so that's, it's, it's a combination of that absolute value, but also the frequency at which it occurs in the different areas. Alligator eggs hunted other than by other small animals? Um, the, the, um, there is an egg collection that's done by, organized by the uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission where they um, allow hunters to come in and take eggs that then go to an alligator farm and so they're raised and then they use those animals on the farm. Um, is that is that what you're talking about? Well, partly, yes. I'm just wondering yeah. if they're hunted and if they're edible to humans. Um, they're they're not very good. I mean, I've I've, I've tried one. Um, <laughs> they're 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 very they're very gamey, and they're, I mean, yes, they're edible for humans. I mean, and I'm sure that I'm sure that people utilize used to utilize them more as a food source when you know that was what was out there. But like I said, I tried them and and. It, it wasn't. It wasn't on the top of my list to continue to try. Yes, back here. Do we have laws protecting alligators against commercial uses? Um, yes, we do. So alligators, alligators used to be, they're actually one of the um, endangered species success stories. They used to be listed as endangered because there was a lot of hunting over, over utilization. Uh, of them, and then they were put on the endangered species list, and their numbers have been able to come to rebound. They are still listed as threatened by similarity of appearance, which means that they are under the um, regulations of the Florida Fish and Wild of, of the states, and in our state, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So you have to have a permit to do anything with alligators. Go ahead. Are there laws against bringing alligator products? If you yes. Go to a farm country and buy an alligator first. Yes. Can you bring it in? Um, if it has the proper CITES tags, yes. So it all depends on what they did, what species of croc crocodilian it is, um, and whether or not they have the appropriate documentation for it. Mm -hmm. But all of that, all of that is regulated. So here and then back there. Okay. Uh, I wanted to know if any testing has been done as to whether an American alligator can mate successfully with a Chinese alligator. Hmm. If, if, I don't know. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think they've done any testing on that. They're so far, they're so far away geographically. Yeah. But interestingly enough, with crocodiles, okay, so we have American crocodiles, we have Cuban crocodiles, and in Cuba, they actually believe that they are interbreeding, and so that there there may be a mixed race there. Um, so, but geographically, that wouldn't be a likely combination. But there are some other species of crocodilians that occur in closer proximity where there are questions about inter. Has any testing been done on that? That's not for not for not for Chinese and American alligators that I know of, anyway. Back here. Have you studied our uh, local mascot, George? <laughs> no, no. Is George is George is George down there now, or is he gone? He's gone. He's gone. He's a nasty guy in his place. Oh, really? Huh? Okay. It's not as big as George. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. No. I. He said George is gone. Ah. What is the average using calendar year age of a alligator before it passes on? Well, okay, so they can live up to like 50 or 60 years old, and a lot of it depends on where they are and what kinds of, of pressures they have. So, for example, in areas where, um, where alligators are hunted, then, then you know, people are taking the nine, ten foot alligators out, so they're probably not going to live as long there. But there are probably a few that can escape that, that live to be 
much older because they're smarter and, and can avoid those pre predate predators. Tell people a little bit about the canals versus the marsh interior as a habitat for alligators. Yeah, so, so um, the, the natural places where alligators occurred were in the marsh. And um, now we have all these canals, and now people see all these alligators in the canals, and they think, wow, we have too many alligators. Well, we actually don't, because alligators are what's called a sink habitat. They're, 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 um, they're a place where they're, the reproduction is very low, and if it was only canals down here, we wouldn't have successful populations, because you, would never, you wouldn't have enough babies to, to um, survive, because the canals don't make very good habitat for the small alligators because there's not enough cover for them, there's not enough food of the right size for them, there's big alligators in there that, that might eat them. And then in addition, it's the whole thing about the nesting and I, t I was talking about the water level fluctuations. If When alligators nest along the canals, unless they're way up on the levee part of it, um, if they, their nests tend to get flooded and so they, they're not, especially here at the refuge, um, and so they don't, they don't produce as, as many young. Um, and so that, that canal habitats are really kind of the habitat where the dispersing animals go. There's a few big males in there, and then the, the kind of the adolescents hang out until they can kind of find out where they, they need to be. And so, um, yeah, it's really the, the marsh habitats that we're focusing on getting right in terms of alligator numbers. Um, and just that you could, because you see a lot of alligators in the canals doesn't mean we're, we're there yet. Yep, go ahead. What would be your weight of an eight-foot or nine-foot alligator? Okay, so the, actually I'll give you the weight of about an, a, um, about a six-foot alligator weighs about um, 20 to 30 kilograms, so that would be 40 to 60 pounds for about a six-foot alligator. So people always overestimate how much an alligator weighs. You know, say, oh, a six-foot alligator, it's gotta be 150 pounds. Mm -hmm. But no, it's, 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 about, it's about half of that. And one of the things we just did was we looked at um, the weight of alligators in the Everglades compared to the weight of alligators in other places. And alligators down here are about 20% lighter than they are in central Florida and in Louisiana. And so this is another indication that you know things are different here. And to some extent, that's probably a natural phenomenon because we are in what's called an oligotrophic system, one with low nutrients, and so, you know, you might expect that they've adapted to that kind of that lower nutrients, but remember I showed you that there's declining body condition, and so you, you couple those two things, and, you know, they're already at that bottom end of the, the weight, and then you're, you're pushing it lower, and so that's, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's not, a, not a good thing. But hopefully, as, as we move forward with Everglades restoration, you know, we'll be able... What? You moving? No. Okay. <laughs> so what I really wanted to do was I really wanted to bring an alligator, a caiman, and a crocodile so I could show you guys up close and personal the difference. But unfortunately, all I was able to get was an alligator. So, sorry. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Yes, his mouth is taped. <laughs> okay, so um, I didn't talk about the adaptations that alligators have for living in wetlands because I knew I was going to bring this guy out and I can show you up close and personal and then I'll, I'll walk him around and, and you can see. But, um, you know, one of the things is they are an aquatic critter and they, but they can be out of water. 
Um, their eyes and their nostrils are on, and their ears are on the top of their head so that they can hang down in the water and very easily sneak up on things as prey. Their eyes have a uh, clear membrane that will go over it so they can have their eyes open underwater. When you look at their feet, you see that they have webs on their back feet that help them to swim. They're very strong. When you, when you touch it, you'll feel the muscle. They're, they're pretty much all muscle. And this is one of the things that's interesting because the worst size alligator to work on is about a seven foot alligator because they are very strong and they are very quick and they don't tire out very quickly. So that's probably the, the that's probably more dangerous to work on than, than say a 12 footer that as long as you know what you're doing, you're gonna tire it out pretty quickly. They are cold blooded and so, you know, when you get lactic acid buildup, you can move it out of your system. They can't, and so they're, 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 they just get fatigued. Um, and that's how, when we catch them, we take advantage of that, and we tire them out before we bring them into the boat. How do you tire them out? Um, it's, it's so, we have a, um, we have a self-locking noose that goes around its neck, and then you just play it like a fish. And, and wait until it gets tired, and then you put the tape around its mouth before you bring it in the boat. So It, it appears that the tail is as long as the, the body. Uh, you are exactly right. It, it, is, it is. It is about, it's, it's actually about 50%, and males and females have a little bit different ratio, but not very much. Mm -hmm. So yes, the tail is half of the alligator. Mm -hmm. um, they also have, these are scoots on the back, and that helps to protect it. You'll feel that they're very bony. This is very soft. This is what we use for boots and yeah, all of that that stuff. And yeah, yeah. So uh, so I'll uh, I'll walk this guy around and feel free. Uh, uh, you, you can touch it. I, I'm going to hold it. You can touch it. <laughs> You're right. It's so soft here. Mm -hmm. So soft. and and if you have other questions, I'll be happy to. And, did you, did you okay. Some osteoderms to show people. No, I didn't. Well, no, I didn't. <laughs> um, I have not sexed it. I probably could. This guy's about big enough to do it. Um, you have to probe the cloaca to to do that. Um, and I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Quite <laughs> lovely. <laughs>